Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. Following me and sharing my videos is really very important. I am a one-man shop. I have no money for advertising, and so social media, that's how I grow. So please do follow me on Twitter, at SYL Tales. And frankly, any other social media, I am on every single one known to man. <laughs> So, let's sit down and talk about Star Trek Picard Season 1, Episode 3, The End is the Beginning. Now, I don't go in my videos and I don't rehash all of the plot. I assume that my viewers here, you have already watched it or that you just don't care if you have it spoiled for you. But nevertheless, just to be safe, I think we should probably issue a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands. Prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a fandai master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me. And that means, unfortunately, this is not a boast or a brag. This is just where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction. The problem with Fandai Masters is that we are cursed. We find that there's nothing new and original, and you can't see the new stuff for the, out seeing the whole century that came before. There just isn't much that's new in the world, and it sometimes interferes with your ability to enjoy things. So, Star Trek Picard, Season 1, Episode 3, uh, The End is the Beginning. Well, I always like to start off, and this was a pretty good episode, I'd say, non-spoiler-wise, this was a decent enough episode. Uh, I'll go into some of the pitfalls with it, but I always like to try to start out by saying something good about what I'm reviewing. So, in terms of great moments, I really like that Picard is showing his age. That's very nice. He gets out of breath when he walks very far. He needs to be protected from the Romulan Death Squad. Uh, he can certainly contribute to the fight. He shoots a couple of people, but he's no longer capable physically of being at the center of a fight. And to be honest, that character was never really well done for adventure and, I mean, action. You know, in the movies, they tried to put him into action circumstances, and the guy was really just too old at that point to be very, very believable. But here, it is a clear nod to the fact that this is an older man. He cannot do the things that he used to do, and that's good. I liked Hugh's appearance. Hugh, he was being played by the same actors we saw in Next Generation. Jonathan Del Arco, it's a very nice callback. His appearance here is completely logical, and uh, assuming that he was on that particular Borg cube or somewhere nearby or had already been pulled out or whatever, because I think the last of we saw of him, he wasn't you know, on his own. He'd been disconnected from the collective, was an individual, but wasn't on his own. But still, very nice that he's there, very nice that he's played by the same actor. This place that they talk about, Free Cloud, looks interesting to me. It seems to be some kind of gambler's paradise at the very least, and I'm curious what it turns out to be. Maybe it's a giant spaceport bar or something. I find it interesting that one would program one's uh, emergency medical hologram to look like exactly like himself. Now, this does definitely give uh, actor Santiago Cabrera a chance to show off his acting skills, and the effects team got to show off the talent. It's, it's cool, but it's also sort of a cringe. You know, if I had an EMH, I would uh, program her to look exactly like Shania Twain sometime in her 40s <laughs> or early 50s. I'm exactly the same age as Shania, 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 Shania Twain. Um, I uh, went to see her in concert during her farewell tour that, of course, never turns out to be a farewell. Uh, but I went to see her. Um, I'm apparently her sole, unattached, heterosexual male fan. Um, I was the only one there who didn't have a date. Uh, I was just by myself. And as she walked past me uh, uh, through the crowd, she was doing a number where she came past me. High-fived her, and I have not washed this left hand in at least five years because of that. But in any case, my EMH would look like Shania Twain, because talking to myself would be a little odd for me. <laughs> And, of course, the very tail end with Picard's Engage, followed by the Jerry Goldsmith Star Trek theme was very nice. 
Um, it was a great way to end this episode. So those are my good moments. I, I you know, the episode in whole was was good all the way around. But I do have some cringe moments, and these are mostly technical things or small things. So don't let the cringe moments make you think that I didn't like this episode because I did. I, I like the episode. I think it's a good episode with some limitations on it dramatically that I'll talk about here and in other videos that I'm going to release shortly. So cringe moments. Um, the ex-Borgs being scarred is weird. And when they took Picard out of being a Borg, he wasn't a scarred when they get rid of his implants. Seven of Nine certainly had no scars as a result of her implants, and she'd been a Borg since childhood. I mean, it's long been established that even 23rd century medical, medical technology of Kirk's era can leave no scars, and that makes perfect sense, you know. Uh, another one is Hugh having uh, different colored eyes. And that's also something that kind of sticks out because, again, 24th century medical technology, this should be a non-issue, the eye color. Looks like he was, you know, given an eye transplant. And, you know, given 24th century medical technology, we've seen it. I'm not sure that's appropriate. Having a Borg mother tongue doesn't make much sense. It has never made sense for the Borg to have any kind of language. I mean, speaking to humans in English is, you know, common and it just makes sense. But when communicating telepathically in a hive mind, language becomes superfluous. I mean, I think at worst, their language would be some kind of computer code like today's binary is. Uh, Commodore O wearing sunglasses. If you know much about Star Trek lore, that doesn't make any sense. It has long been established that Vulcan's sun is more intense than Earth's. In fact, um, it is so intense that Vulcans have a second eyelid, a second inner eyelid, that automatically clicks in when something too bright is shown. And we saw this in the 23rd century when Spock's inner eyelid saved him from blindness when something far more intense light was used on him. If anything, you'd think the Vulcans would need something that increased the amount of ambient lighting when they're on the place like Earth rather than decreasing it. That doesn't, to me, make sense. Uh, well, one that just stuck out at me, I, I, the Rubik's Cube. Um, it's a cute callback, but I've been around since Rubik's Cubes were actually very popular. And they were popular, what, the 1980s, 1990s? So having it here, I mean, you think, you know, wouldn't they have more effective rehabilitation techniques or something like that, you know, you'd think there'd be something better. Pardon me. Also, uh, <laughs> one that really, really got me, I really hated, having a piece of titanium sticking out of your shoulder and not either, well, all three of these, a, being in a tremendous amount of pain, <laughs> B, bleeding out all over the place, and C, not needing to even be bandaged. Okay, this is at best a recipe for serious infection, not to mention severe muscle tam tissue damage. Um, you know, the EMH should have been able to heal that thing very, very quickly, given what we know about modern 24th century technology. But in reality, Rios would have just bled all over the place and bled out in short order. You don't get a thing like that sticking in your shoulder the way it did without a lot of pain and a lot of blood. You know, uh, that, was just dumb. that was just dumb, I thought. The EMH obviously has its own sapient intelligence, and uh, this is a nice advancement from what we saw of the Doctor in Star Trek Voyager. However, there was a major ongoing subplot in Voyager about holographic intelligences being used as slaves. And here we see the EMH, you know, he's got his own intelligence, but he's really being used as nothing more than a sounding board and a slave. I mean, has the Federation made no advances in this area in the last 20, 30 years? I mean, they're still using intelligent, sapient beings as slaves? I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't pay off that whole subplot very well. It just said, ah, you know, we had all that stuff happen in Voyager. It doesn't really matter. I don't know. Just didn't like it. And, this, and again, this medical hologram is, is more than just a hologram, a medical slave. He also appears to be a slave as the engineer of the ship. Um, he talks about stuff like that. And again, he's just a slave. And, and that doesn't, 
doesn't sit well with me because of what happened in Voyager. You'd think that they'd have, you know, come up with something better. Uh, smoking in Star Trek is kind of inappropriate. It, it sort of works here because it establishes Rios as some sort of, you know, Han Solo-like rogue. But one of Gene Roddenberry's long-established rules for Star Trek was that by the 23rd century, people just didn't smoke anymore. It uh, put him in some level of trouble in the 1960s because at that time, cigarette ads were a major source of TV revenue. You saw cigarette ads all over the place back then. Then there's the inclusion of The Tragic Sense of Life by Miguel de Unamuno. Got to pronounce that right. Uh, this book, by the way, is in the public domain. You can find it on Project Gutenberg. There is a link to it in my description box. This um, really shouldn't be a popular uh, book, except maybe a historically uh, in an enlightened, utopic 24th century. It was written by a man with a very dark take on humanity. Um, so much so... Uh, so, you know, that it's the problem is that much of your entertainment, it, it, that much of this is supposed to be an enlightened, hopeful vision of the future. That was Gene Roddenberry's whole thing. That's why he made Star Trek. And while it is something and tells you a little about, you know, um, Rios's character, it's indicative of a far larger problem. And that is that our culture, our modern culture, has become increasingly dark and foreboding for absolutely no reason. It permeates all of our pop culture, including Star Trek Discovery. I mean, that's why Discovery is so dark. It's that modern writers think that darkness is more realistic, but it's not. It's really not. See, darkness only exists really in one place, Hollywood, California. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. It is a place where horrible people do horrible things to other horrible people all day long. It's a place where a handshake means nothing and rape and child molestation rule the day. The people living in Hollywood, the ones who create all of our popular entertainment, whether it's music or films or TV, they really only see darkness throughout their entire lives because of where they live. And consequently, darkness is the only thing they can create. If all you know is darkness, then all you can create is darkness. And they, they also assume that this darkness exists everywhere. But it doesn't. It largely only exists in Hollywood. In the Western world, your life is very bright and very hopeful. In the United States, in fact, is so rich that even our poor people can become obese. I mean, compare that to any third world country where they have starvation. But unfortunately, since all of our popular entertainment is made by these people who only see darkness in their lives, this universal portrayal of darkness has now seeped into our popular culture. Now, Star Trek was an explicit, very, very explicit attempt to show a hopeful future where mankind had overcome all of our modern ills. There was certainly plenty to be, you know, conflict and stuff to be had, but they were usually over some other culture's problems. Whenever our modern problems were ever mentioned in Star Trek, we were also very explicitly told about the same time that we had long since overcome them. You know, the world is not dark. It really isn't. Not for anyone in the Western world. So I, I wouldn't pay attention to the darkness of your entertainment. It's, it's fiction. It's written by people who are no longer capable of even imagining things that are good or noble, they're just propagandizing to you. They want you to believe that the world is a horrible place for you personally when it is demonstrably not. <laughs> Again, Hollywood, California, you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Then there is the Mars destruction. The size of Mars is, they don't understand it. Here we have this, these structures, as you can see, that they're getting destroyed, they showed in the beginning of the episode, are visible from orbit. Now, these things must be thousands of diameters or more, um, and I know this because. This is the Schiaparelli crater, the second largest crater on Mars. It's about 300 miles in diameter. For comparison, I have put New York City in the middle of the crater. It's that little rectangle in the center. Okay, So <clears throat> these structures that we're seeing here are gigantic. 
you know, if it was even New York City, it shouldn't be visible from orbit at this distance. You, it shouldn't be visible. But these things are gigantic, you know. And not only that, but if you were to attack New York City, it wouldn't even really be visible from orbit. It, it might be a like a bright spot if you nuked the city. I, I don't know. But their conception of distance here, they, they are treating Mars as though it was a, a lunar colony. That's more suited to a lunar colony. On Mars, you wouldn't even be able to see most of that structure from orbit, except at night when you'd be able to see the lights. It's one of the worst things in this scientifically. There are no flammable gases in Mars's atmosphere. The atmosphere is, in fact, 95.32% carbon dioxide, 2.6% molecular nitrogen, and 1.9% argon. It does contain some trace levels of water vapor, oxygen, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and other gases. But the only one of these that is particularly flammable is hydrogen. And there's really so little of it that it doesn't matter. The 95 plus percent of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would instantly extinguish any hydrogen fire. And the reason for that is real simple. Carbon dioxide is not flammable. In fact, some fire extinguishers, especially those that are used for like electrical fires and stuff like that, are used with carbon dioxide under heavy pressure inside of it. And I've seen this in my own uh, case in IT, where I was in my career for 40 years. And because it's a gas, it is easy to disperse large amounts of it very automatically in IT infrastructure rooms. So at one point, it was heavily used for fire suppression in um, you know, data centers. But it's not uh, really the one that we like to use anymore because the problem is you put out too much of it it's very very easy to suffocate in that environment so the entire premise of mars still burning 15 or more years after this attack should be just something that is ridiculous it's just preposterous you know i shouldn't say it and it continues to bother me here. They mention it too. Thousands of lives lost. They mention it in first episode, 93,143 lives lost. Well, again, the problem is it's been long established since the original series that Mars has been inhabited for a very long time. In fact, it was stated in 2266 by a federation. And remember, this show takes place in 2399. But back in 2266, a Federation attorney mentioned that Mars had a document called the Fundamental Declaration of the Martian Colonies. And it was implied that this was something similar to the U.S. Declaration of Independence or maybe its Constitution. But as we see, if we take it as read here, that the buildings and structures are visible from orbit, the sheer scale of those buildings must be mean their home to millions, hundreds of millions of people. They are gigantic. You know, the, the, the stuff we see on that picture, it would be a significant chunk of North America. Not, not the structures themselves, but the ones we see put together would be a significant chunk of North America. It would be like saying we're going to extinguish the entire East and West Coasts, home to millions of people. And again, it shouldn't even be an issue for the most part because CO2 puts out fires. <laughs> Starfleet demanding the Romulans uh, doesn't make sense. Um, however, this is really uh, kind of a um, discussion that in involves a completely different, uh, goes off on a big tangent. So I'm not going to sit here and you know bore you with that. I am going to have another video about why that doesn't make sense, and it'll drop probably sometime today, maybe tomorrow, depending on the time. Swearing in Star Trek is never appropriate. However, that is, again, a discussion that merits its own video rather than boring you with it here. So watch for that video that will drop later today. Bothered me a little uh, about Star Picard's rank, as we saw here at the beginning. See, in 2379, during the last next-gen movie, Star Trek Nemesis, Picard was, called, was a captain. He was actually, you know, captain. By 2387, only a few years later, when he resigned from Starfleet, he was a four-star admiral. Now, that's, that's only one rank below the commander-in-chief, the CNC that they talk about, who is a five-star admiral of the fleet. That means that in only eight years, Picard went from captain to commodore to rear admiral to vice admiral to admiral. 
And in reality, that just doesn't happen in real life. And I can buy, I can buy maybe a three-star vice admiral because, you know, but four-star just stretches it for me a hell of a lot, especially even if he's a highly decorated guy. And yes, I know, I know, they made Janeway a three-star vice admiral, an immediate jump from captain, and it was dumb then. Um, they should maybe have had her a two-star rear admiral rather than, you know, based on her experience with the Borg, but not a vice admiral. Um, they might, however, have bumped Picard to four-star admiral when he retired. In real life, being bumped up one rank on retirement happens so that the retired officer can then draw a pension based on the, <laughs> up the pay t tier of the next rank above them when they were actually serving. One of the big ones that really, really bothers me is Rafi going from a Starfleet lieutenant commander to a destitute, drug-abusing booze swiller. That's just ridiculous. It has been long established that by the 24th century, Earth is a literal utopia. There is no money, a specific plot point, in Star Trek for The Voyage Home. And this makes a lot of sense in the 24th century, where replicators mean that anyone can have anything they like with the push of a button. It's been long established that replicators can create anything, you know, not just food. And even if they cashiered her from Starfleet, she could retire to somewhere very nice other than a trailer at the Vasquez Rocks. There's plenty of work in the private sector. Um, a Starfleet lieutenant commander is an experienced officer. A former lieutenant commander could probably be captain of just about any ship she wanted to in the civilian life. It might not even, you know, might, might not be Starfleet, but in a federation that's composed of a thousand war planets, there would be civilian exploration that operates on the federation frontier. You see, space is big. I mean, really big. I mean, you may think it's a long walk down from your home to the local pharmacy, but that is just peanuts compared to space. It's something that was actually um, kind of addressed in a, in a satiric way, but it's true, in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy when they talked about the total perspective vortex. And this is when your brain is plugged into something that allows you to see the entire infinity of the universe. And you are an invisible dot on an invisible dot with a tiny little marker that says, you are here. And in fact, even in the Federation itself, you would still be an invisible dot on an invisible dot. There is absolutely no possible way that Starfleet could have enough ships to explore the incredible vastness of this galaxy. It's been established, in fact, that by the 24th century, only 11% of the galaxy had even been explored. That leaves about 88% to go. <laughs> and, you know... Okay, even excluding space, right? There's plenty of other work for someone with her experience. It has also been established that former Starfleet officers can go on to be governors of colonial planets. Um, we saw this when Commodore Wesley resigned Starfleet to be governor, governor of the Antilles colony, circa 2270. And even if there weren't that, if she wasn't experienced enough to be governor, there's still a lot of jobs that could still be done and use her a kind of experience on a colony. Um, She'd, be, I think, be able to put her resume out there and get all kinds of offers from all kinds of colonies. See, colonies, by definition, are fairly small, and meaning that the planets they, they colonize are going to be largely unexplored and containing all kinds of dangers that maybe aren't visible from orbital scans. So having somebody with her experience would make a lot of sense. One other minor, minor thing. Uh, a member of this Romulan death squad talking at all. Um, seems just out of character to me. He had just suicide the moment he woke up and realized he was captured. There's a, <laughs> we've seen this actually, you know, we've seen it. We've seen it in Balance of Terror back in 1966. And there is, in fact, an old fanish joke that comes back from that era. How many Romulans does it take to t change a trans stator? And the answer is two. One to change the stator and the other to blow the ship up out of shame. <laughs> Old, old joke. But again, it sort of applies here. I don't think he would have said one word to them. He just would have suicided. So, 
First, the writing. I don't always approach this from the perspective of the actors, because as a former actor myself, I know that the people in front of the camera are the ones who tend to get all of the glory, but it's the ones behind the camera that really deserve the lion's share of it. So I start out with the writing. And I do that because everything begins and ends with the script. If you ain't got no script, you ain't got nothing to shoot. So everything that happens in the script, particularly the good and the bad, is ultimately the fault of the writers. In this case, we again have the writers of Michael Chabon and James Duff. Now, Chabon, as I mentioned last week, is a very, very experienced writer who has written both stuff things that, that won the Hugo, which is the award that impresses me, and the Pulitzer Prize, which is the award that impresses people who don't know how great the Hugo is. He has never, in looking at his career, seemed to have turned into a real dud. And Duff has done a lot of screen work with a fair amount of crap. I would say it's probably 75, 25, 75 percent good, 25 percent that turns out to be crap. But he does have a lot of work under his belt. So as with the last episode, I'd have to credit most of the writing here to Siobhan. It's uh, written very well. Uh, the soap opera drama that is so common on other shows, particularly Discovery, is not really here. When it is here, it is an adult soap opera. We're seeing, you know, somebody like Rafi, who is a complete mess, you know, talking with Picard. She's not, it's not, oh, I love you and blah, 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 and kissing and all that. We do see a little bit of that, you know, with, um, when we get into the Romulans and stuff, but but that's somebody playing somebody. It's it's him taking advantage of her. It's not really actually having any you know real emotional relationship. At least I don't think it is. The script does flow very very nicely. It certainly remains engaging, and the flaw here is simply that very little happens in it. It's not going to age well because of that, and and I can tell you why very specifically. But again, kind of lengthy. Probably a discussion for another video because it applies not only to Picard, but also to uh, Star Trek Discovery and for the exact same reasons. I'm going to talk about that in some later episode. But in spite of this, the story still remains engaging. I was never really bored. I was just kind of like, okay, can we get, you know, moving and get things happening so we can maybe find out what the hell is going on here, you know. I would compare the way that this is paced you might compare it to the final episode, the series finale of Star Trek The Next Generation, which is all good things, because something very similar was happening there in terms of the action, the story. You know, we have Picard being old, needing to get the band back together to go do this one thing. And so it's very similar. But what we saw in Picard, that chunk of the story was accomplished in 15 or 20 minutes, and that was all. I would be very interested, and I hope somebody does, uh, doing a um, fan edit of this thing, you know, that might whittle it down to only a couple of three hours tops by taking out some of this extraneous stuff and tightening it up in terms of editing. I don't know. Then we have our acting. I'll get into the actors next. I you know, probably don't deserve being gotten into to until towards the end, but I don't want to bore everybody to death about the other stuff before I talk about the actors. So we'll try to catch you with this and keep you for the other guys. Picard, played by Sir Patrick Stewart. Well, this is Sir Patrick. This is a man who has never done a bad performance in anything he's ever done, be it stage or screen, no matter how large or how small the part is. He is a knight for a reason. I would not be surprised if he was elevated to the peerage before his death. He is, as always, incredible. There is nothing, nothing whatsoever to criticize about his performance. He is great. Then we have Ice of Bronze as uh, Soji. Um, okay, I think I know what's going on here. I think Maddox used Borg technology to create she and her sister. And she um, or uh, her sister, uh, they are just... Uh, I'm sorry, I lost a chunk of my thing here. I have a script, and it, for some unknown reason... Um, shot way above where I was so and I only do this in one take for various reasons so let me get back to where the script is talking about Soji again I think she is um, a combination of Borg and uh, Android technology and somehow putting this together inside of you know physical organs and things like that I think Maddox used that technology and she's going to turn out to be some kind of Borg sleeper agent judging by what we heard her say today 
Uh, again, Hugh, played by Jonathan Del Arco. It was interesting because he's no longer part. Uh, he is disconnected. From, um, he's not the disconnected drone that we saw in Next Generation. He's become more human, um, like Seven of Nine. You know, he's pretty much got his personality together over the years, and that's nice to see. And just being played very well. You know, you see echoes. There are some echoes of what we saw in TNG, but with a performance that is building on that as a character uh, with the same actor. So, again, good callback. Nice use here. Interesting to see that he is head of this whole project, which makes some level of sense. So. Um, Rafi uh, Mus uh, Musiker, played by Michelle Hurd. Aside from the uh, issues that I mentioned, the improbabilities of her uh, turning into what she is, uh, she does a, a very good performance. I entirely believe her as a down-and-out, destitute, drug-using, and booze-swilling shell of a woman. I, I totally believe it. I, I don't think it's appropriate, given what we know about Earth and Federation technology and society, but she plays it well. There's nothing wrong with it. Um... Chris Rios and the uh, emergency medical hologram that also seems to be the engineer, uh, played by Santiago Cabrera. Um, sorry, Ca Cabrera, Cabrera. Santiago Cabrera. Got to remember that from an extra use. This was a very good performance. He's obviously talented. He's giving us two separate personalities, very separate personalities that are very disparate. Gives him a good chance to show off his range. A lot of actors don't get that chance in a single series. Narek, of course, is played by Harry Treadaway, and there's not much to see here aside from him playing Soji and his interactions with his sister, who is obviously threatening to kill him if things go sideways. Dr. Agnes Girardi, played by Alison Pill. Um, we finally get to see something more of her, you know, in terms of just being exposition dump, which she's kind of been before. It's just exposition dump. Her reaction to having killed someone is nice, though... Kind of improbable. In reality, people who've killed someone, even in self-defense, suffer some kind of shock and significant uh, reaction, often real remorse. To gloss over that um, in a show that is trying to be more realistic psychologically just seems out of place. This is something that takes a person a while to get used to. However, she does play what the script gives her with you know, very good um, I don't, you know, I don't know how much of the script said she needs to look this way or needs to look that way, but she played somebody. Oh my God! It just shot someone. That's terrifying. Oh no! What have I done? Very, very well. You know, no, no problems with that. Lara played by uh, Lars, Lars brother played by Orla Brady and Javon played by James McShane. I'm going to mention them in the same breath because really what I like about them is the relationship that they have with Picard. I really like that relationship. I think it's fun. I wish that they were going to go with him because I'd like to see more of that dynamic, but sadly, they're gone now. Narissa Riz, uh, Rizzo, played by P Peyton List. I did not catch her Romulan name if it was stated, and we only see her briefly, but again, she comes off as a complete conniving bitch who is willing to kill her own brother and if things go sideways. My uh, criticism about her uh, from last week really stands. How do you pass off, you know... A green-blooded person with a completely different internal arrangement in terms of their internal organs and a totally different arrangement of how their brains work, how do you pass them off as a human just because you put round, rounded eyebrows and rounded their ears off? And you can't tell me, right? You're not going to say to me, please, don't tell me, oh, this worked with Kirk in the Enterprise incident. incident. Uh, no, that was different. He was on the Romulan ship for like two hours at tops. He beamed over, he stole the cloaking device, and he came back. Um, you know, why not just pass her off as a Vulcan? I think that's what's happening with Commodore O. We've been told many, many times that Vulcan and Romulan life signs are basically the same, that it's really hard to determine them. So just have her come to Starfleet as a Vulcan. That's what I don't get. And to the mechanics of making a film... The director is, as has been the case for the first three episodes, Hanel Culpepper. This is her third episode. Um, I was really, you know, I always like her direction. I like it very much. I find pieces of it really very nice. One of the things that really struck out at me on this one was the choreography and the direction of that fight scene with the Romulan Death Squad. It was not over-choreographed, and you could follow the action. 
This is very much in stark contrast to a lot of different things that we see today, uh, action-wise. And um, probably the best example of this is Batwoman, where the fights are just impossible to follow. Cinematography is by Darren Natierman, and as always, one hopes for a collaboration between the director and the cinematographer. I say this a lot. <laughs> Director's job is to get is to tell the cinematographer what shots they want. The cinematographer's job is to get those shots. If you have a good collaboration, the cinematographer might say, you know, we could do this shot maybe just a little more interesting, a little more um, dramatic, a little more comedic, whatever the you know shot re is requiring. If we maybe shoot it just slightly differently, change the lighting a little bit, and the director will talk and they'll talk and go, yeah, you know, that's probably a good idea. Let's do it that way. So I don't know if that's happening here. I have no idea. You have to be sitting on set to know. But whatever's happening is, is working very well. Cinematography is basically all perfect, um, especially the shots. You know, they're, they're composed flawlessly. Um, the you know, the lighting is really good for every scene. And, and again, I'm particularly um, impressed by those fight scenes. And there's lots and lots of fight scenes these days that are really hard to follow. And the room where it happens is relatively darkly lit. It's not pitch black. And that's because that would be normal lighting under the circumstances considering where they are. But it wasn't so dark that you couldn't follow the action. And again, if you really want to know the see, see Batwoman, that's a perfect example of one where you can't follow the action. Production design is again by Todd Cherniowski. Um, as always, I think the production design here is great. There was a fair amount of location shooting from time to time. The sets inside of uh, Picard, Chateau Picard are actually a real building, um, and, and they made some changes and put in the lighting, but uh, that set actually exists. Uh, did some location shooting on the Vasquez Rocks, which uh, is rather uh, iconically established with Star Trek just for one episode in which Kirk fought the Gorn. But for some reason, it has been just completely associated with Star Trek ever since. I do not quite understand why. So we got some location shooting there. I love location shooting. Please, guys, feel free to location shoot anytime you possibly can. <laughs> I love location shooting far more than I do green screening. But the production design is where it's a set is always great. And actually, I really like the interior of Rios's spaceship. I did not catch the name of it. Music is again, again by Jeff Russo, a very experienced guy, had come to this with a lot of music under his belt. And again, he's doing great work. I will be interested in listening to the music when the soundtrack of the mute becomes available for it. Um, I'm not yet certain that he qualifies as a maestro under my definition of it, but he is still certainly doing very fine work. I'm going to be very interested, and I'm going to spend some time listening not just to this, but also his prior work. I have to, if I'm going to call somebody a maestro, I have to know their work. It can't just be a one single thing. I have to be able to look at their career and see, okay, this is where they flipped over. They used to be a guy that just did good soundtracks, and then they flipped and became a maestro somewhere along the line. So I need to listen to all of the work that he's done so I know what he's you know, capable of and what he's been doing. The visual effects are awesome, as always, particularly in and around that Borg cube. I mean, these days, you know, in terms of special effects, there's not... It's, it's, it's like that first opening shot in... Um, Revenge of the Sith, right. By then, you know, whole movies were being produced in CGI, so it wasn't shockingly, incredibly um, something that you look at and go, wow, that's really amazing, because you knew it was all CGI. And similarly here, when we go in inside the Borg Cube and move around, that's we all know that's CGI. But... It's still effective. I still like it. And I assume the effects teams had something to do with de-aging Patrick Stewart at the beginning of the episode. That was very well done. Costume designer again, Christine Clark. And as I say in other episodes, a costume should tell you something about the character. So, for example, I mean, people make choices about what they wear all the time, and it tells you something about the person, you know. If you saw me on the street, I'd be wearing a geeky T-shirt. I, I got a NASA one that I was wearing today. Um, and jeans. That's how you'd see me in real life. What I'm doing here is a costume. Nobody dresses like this in real life, not where I live, certainly. So I'm doing a costume with this vest, the shirt, the hat, the bolo tie, and I'm doing this because I want to push a brand. I want to push a brand that I'm a kind of folksy guy who is giving you reviews from part of the country that isn't 
doesn't we don't usually see reviews from and I want you to see that I'm an intelligent guy as a representative Nebraska represent um, of this part of the country to tell you who, people who might think of us as just flyover country hey we're, we're not that stupid actually <laughs> But in this episode, we do see multiple very different costumes. Uh, it's really, really striking when you see them in the bridge, for example, and you know that big shot where they're looking at them all from the direction just before Picard goes engage. Um, you can see the difference in costume instantaneously. There are very different costumes there, and they're saying very different things about the character, and it all works very good. Makeup department head is James McKinnon, and again, I assume they had something to do with the de-aging of Patrick Stewart at the beginning. Also very well done. The other makeup is flawless, particularly the Romulans, especially the ones with the forehead ridge appliances. Um, they were very, very much more subtle than what we saw in Star Trek The Next Generation, and that's appropriate for this show. You had to look good in 1080p. The ones they did in Next Gen looked fine for the resolution that they had available at the time, but now if you see it in Blu-ray, you know, you can start to see where things go on and all that. This they're clearly doing a lot more subtly, um, and I saw something where they were talking about how for Romulans, you know, they're putting individual hairs in for their uh, eyebrows. Uh, again, that's all just necessary for 1080p. It all works. It is all good in 1080p, which is a hell of a lot harder to do than you think. So at the end of any episode, we would ask ourselves, is it any good? Yes, this is a good episode. It's really only marred by a slow pace that is part of the series by design. But it is definitely it is wor definitely wor worth watching. It is definitely a, an episode worth watching. You need to have this one. I mean, the whole thing is one long 10-part arc. You can kind of liken it really to, you know, the 1930s Flash Gordon serials. You get a piece of the action in one episode, then it goes off into something else. When next episode, next episode, it's all one giant story that's connected together by ten parts. The only thing about it is that I don't think over time that that is going to age well. But again, I have another video coming out later today, hopefully, about that. And uh, you can see why it is that I don't think that'll age. It's for dramatic purposes, nothing else. So that is all that I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks. I'll do my best to respond to you. So, next time on the Fandai Masters Review of Star Trek Picard Season 1, Episode 4, Absolute Candor. Picard must fill out his crew with a Romulan who looks almost exactly like Elrond from Lord of the Rings. Now Picard must learn if swords and melee weapons can overcome ranged energy weapons. That's next time on the Fandai Masters Review of Star Trek Picard Season 1 Episode 4, Absolute Candor. So, thanks for watching. That is all the time that we have today for this episode of Tales from S.Y.L. Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.